everyone. Welcome to our Tuesday lunch on this beautiful spring day. Um, today I have the pleasure of introducing Xiao Zheng in the Department of Economics and Xiao will be speaking to us today about value-added erosion in global value chains, rethinking international trade. So please join me in welcoming Xiao. Well, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Everything okay? All right. So first of all, I'd like to thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it. You know, and second of all, I'd like to special thank Joe for organizing this. I was organizing this two years ago. I know how much work goes into this. So thank you very much for doing so. Okay. So uh, this is work that I've been working on. Okay. So I just want to you know uh, show you what I've got so far. Okay. So it's called a value added erosion in global value chain. We're thinking international trade. Okay, so first of all, I want to talk about what is global value chain first, okay? So what is global value chain? Global value chain is a newly observed pattern of global trade, okay? It's not really a new phenomenon, but newly observed phenomenon in global trade. And it's characterized by countries specializing in segments of a production process rather than, you know, final, a set of final products. Okay. So when I teach international trade, I always tell my student it's no longer one for class because first economist who start talking about international trade is this guy whose name is David Ricardo, okay, who will use the example of Portugal and England trading with each other and Portugal would exporting wine to England and England would export glass to Portugal. So that's example of trade for final products, right? So that's why for the longest time, people, when people think about international trade, they think in terms of trading final products. But with existence of global value chain, it's no longer like that, okay? So existence of global value chain is being mainly documented by the steady increase of import content of export. So, you know, the export that a country, you know, export to ship out to another country contains higher, high imported content, okay? So it's no longer one for class, okay? And normally, it is, this process is viewed as a process of deepening international division of labor, right? So think about the whole production process. One country produces, adds some value, ship to another country, adds some value, ship to a third country, and in the end, become a final product, right? So in the end, it's really deepening of international division of labor, okay? So um, there is some advantage of global value chain. As soon as this phenomenon has been uh, observed, right, people have been saying nice things about the global value chain. Okay, first of all, people think that global value chain is going to increase, increase labor productivity, right? Because if you normally, you know, if you have a more division of labor, you will have a more product, higher productivity. Now, if you specialize in producing something over, over, over again, right, then you're more familiar with such a production process and more likely you will be able to innovate, right? And also think that people think that also promote trade openness with the existence of, existence of a global value chain, right? Uh, that just facilitates the process a little bit more. If you're not only, not only you can buy and sell final goods internationally, but also you can divide your labor up. That's even better, okay? And also to reduce the effectiveness, effectiveness of trade obstacles. So if you think about tariff, all those policies, those tariffs are mostly tariffs for final goods and services exported, right? So, so, you know, with global value chain, you can actually ship your, you know, your, your, your products you know, to another country and do a round of polishing, for example, then you can avoid the tariff, okay? So some people think that's, you know, uh, existence of global value chain will help the reduction of the 
you know, uh, w w will help to re reduce the effectiveness, effectiveness of trade, trade obstacles, and also it facilitates foreign information diffusion. So if I'm a developing country and I have import intermediates, I import some very fancy products in, right, and then add value onto that by working with that fancy technique, right, technology from foreign country, right, then the technology might diffuse. Right, and then I can benefit from that. I'm not sure President Trump's gonna like that, but you know, in principle, that can do. Right, and finally, you know, it attracts foreign capitals. Right, so this this thing called foreign direct investment. Right, firms can flow into other countries and set up shops. Right, and specialize in production process. Okay, so those are pretty standard argument. People have been seeing sounds about global value chain. Okay, so there are some also, you know, there are some problems and complications with global value chain at least, right? First of all, it's really, first problem really lies in trade statistics, okay? So with global value chain, since each country exports contains import content, and such content can be extremely large, right? So that a country's export statistics might really overstate this country's actual export. I'll show you an example later, okay? And also, I um, just remember that when you look at a country's export, right, when you, when you, when you, when you take a look at the export statistic, that comes from the custom statistic, right? So that's the export value of the final goods, okay? But if your export value contains a lot of import content, then that gets a little fuzzy, right? And also, you know, uh, countries, uh, also, uh, due to the existence of import content of export, those import content of export are actually double counted when we calculate the total world trade by summing up all the countries' exports. Okay? Actually, according to a very detailed study around 2012, about 28% of world trade has been double counted due to the existence of import content of export. Okay? Let me just give you an example, you know, what do we mean by overstating, over mean, what do we mean by overstating the country's actual export, right? Back then, uh, in early 2000s, this very Asian Development Bank uh, did a really interesting study tracing the global value chain of Apple's iPhone 3's major components and cost drivers, cost drivers okay? So the Apple's iPhone 3 final Price is 178 US dollar and it was shipped out of China. Okay, so this gets recorded. So it's from the Foxconn, right, and it's shipped out of China. So this gets recorded as Chinese export value, right? But if you trace its intermediate components, you will see some of them the flash memory is from Japan, the application processor is from Korea, the camera module, right, the GPS receiver is from Germany, US, Japan. All the intermediate contents are from foreign countries, but if you really look at the manufacturing cost, that's the value added that Chinese workers actually add on the value to ship the ex to, 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 to produce the export, it's only $6.5. So that amounts to above 3% of the export value. Okay? So that gets fuzzy. Okay? That's why recently people, been, including me, people have been promoting looking at the trading value added rather than just net export and import because it gets inflated, okay? First layer of a problem. A second layer of a problem is this. I'm just gonna flash this out, you know, and then we're gonna go back to this slide a little bit later. People start worrying about the distributional conflict within the global value chain. If you look at the many global value chain, not all, but the many of the global value chain, they tend to structure in such a way. There are foreign lead firms, okay, over there. So if, if you can think of this whole block as an export value, okay, and the foreign lead firm, where's the, eh, probably not wrong. Okay, the foreign lead firm tend to have, and tend to operate with very high markup ability, high negotiation power, so they have ability to capture a very high proportion of value added, okay? And they tend to specialize in high value adding activities such as advertising, financing, product design, all that kind of stuff. And then gradually they tend to subcontract actual production 
to lower lower tier the firms in global value chain in developing countries, often developing countries, but not always. Okay? So you have this kind of easy metric power structure where on the top you have lead firms enjoying monopolistic power, and then in, at the bottom you have uh, small suppliers with a very, very small amount of negotiation and market power operating in some sort of perfect competitive, very, very competitive environment. Okay? So from this angle, we do see some problem of a distributional conflict. Right, so the distribution of value added is not really based on your productivity, it's based on the negotiation power that you have, okay, which is a layer of um, complication. Okay? So two problems that we see. Well, for the past years, I've been focusing a lot on trade and employment. So what I wanted to explore is the employment aspect of this issue, of this global value chain. Okay? So, just to give you some picture, okay, as we born economists, you know, love to draw pictures uh, when we present this stuff. Okay, so imagine if you have two countries. Think, imagine a world without a global value chain. So all the export and imports are final goods, okay? So you have a country A, let's say that's a home country, okay? And country A will export goods and services to country B, and the export is going to generate domestic labor demand, right? Okay? And also at the same time, you know, if you import goods and services from country B, right, you're going to generate foreign labor demand, right? If you have no global value chain, that's the final. You only export importing final goods. Okay? Now, in the world with a global value chain gets a little bit complicated, okay? Imagine this is on country A, okay, and I produce, so imagine this, I'm in this country, okay? I'm trying to export cheese to country B, okay? So my export is cheese. But in order to produce my export, okay, I might have imported some milk from country B to begin with, right? And then I add some value and make that into cheese and send it to country B. Make sense? So that my export actually has, contains my final export and contains the import content of export. Okay, so my export actually creates domestic demand for me, for my country, but at the same time, don't forget, I'm also producing some foreign demand for the country that I'm shipping my products to. Okay? Same thing, look at import. I might import some cheese from country B. Okay? So, so the country B, of course, you know, will produce cheese, but for country B to produce cheese, Country B might first import some milk, milks from me as intermediate inputs, right? So my import from country B might actually generate some labor demand for my country domestically. At the same time, country B might actually import some cheeses, some, some, some milk from another country, third country, fourth country, fifth country, right? So that, my import from country B, not only is going to generate uh, employment, right, in country, country B and in country A myself, but also in third countries, okay? So essentially, you know, with global value chain, a country's trade can be decomposed into five different components, right? So you have final export, final import, import content of export, export content of import, and then third countries, third parties, bilateral trade, okay? So each component can be Countries' component can be decomposed. Export can be decomposed into these five parts. Okay. Now, a couple of ideas. Now, fortunately, when I was working on this, there's a very, very nice database called the Word Input Output Database. It gives the input output data and the bilateral trade data for 40 countries that covers about 85% of the world GDP. And all data are harmonized into 35 productive sectors, agriculture, services, manufacturing, all those, you know, 35 different sectors. And also the bilateral trade data is also split into intermediate and final demand. So we can, de so with this, we're able to decompose each country's trade into the five aforementioned, aforementioned components, right? And also we have 
the data is provided on time series based from 1995 to 2001, okay, to, to sorry, 2011, okay. And also, what is also nice is that we have social economic accounts that provides employment data for most of the countries on sectoral level, including even skill, skill types. So with this database and with a technique that I developed, and I'm not going to bore you guys with, you know, uh, I, would be, I was able to, de first of all, decompose a country's uh, trade into five, each country's trade into five components, export-import, import content of export, export content import, and a third party bilateral trade. I'm also able to extract the labor content, that means you know, to calculate the labor demand generated from each component. So for each country, the final good export is gonna generate domestic employment, right? Final good import is gonna generate foreign employment. The import content of export generate foreign employment, okay? And export content of import generate domestic employment. And the third party bilateral trade, trade, that's the third country that get involved in that. That's employment. Okay, that's foreign employment. Okay? So I was able to generate, you know, the data on that. I just want to give you some preliminary interest result that might be a little interesting for you to see. Okay? Just based on our calculation for our panel of 39 countries, final good trade have generated about 538 million jobs in the year of 2009, okay, because we want to, we want to avoid the financial crisis data point because that ruins the overall pattern, okay, so we just stop at 2009. And also trading intermediates have generated, trading intermediate has generated about 88 jobs in the world, okay, that's, we call that global value chain jobs. And Import content of export tend to demand medium and, and low skill workers, okay? At aggregate, okay? And India, Indonesia tend to demand more low skill workers, and China, Finland, and Sweden tend to demand more high skill workers in their import intermediate, which is actually uh, quite puzzling for people uh, in the field of international trade, right? Uh, because people will think that the poor country will tend to demand labor, you know, that are more low-skilled. And also in USA, is import alone have generated about 11 million jobs in USA. And remember, I mean, this is probably a data that, this is probably just a word you should, you should focus on. It's import, huh? It's the USA's imports actually generate about 1.1 million jobs in USA itself. Okay, so import generates domestic labor. And in Germany, it's export alone have generated about 50 million jobs in other countries. So in this world, I'm just using an example, okay? Export, sorry, uh, 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 export actually generated jobs in other countries, okay? Due to the existence of import intermediates. And countries with the biggest difference between domestic and foreign employment generated are China, India, Indonesia, and Brazil. So those are just data, you know, just the result, preliminary result I wanted to show you guys to show the effects of a global value chain, you know, unemployment. And in the world with a global value chain, as we can see, export actually generates foreign employment and import generates domestic employment, as a matter of fact. Okay? However, you know, I'm not just, this is interesting but boring at the same time. You know, what I wanted to do is I want the result to actually explain some economic phenomenon. That would be interesting, right? And that's what I call the value added erosion. Okay? So take the example of China, okay? If we think about the China, it's always a two China Chinese uh, international trade, it's always two lines of story going up, right? The popular line of the story is this very rapid uh, increase of foreign trade and trade surplus since its economic reform. Right? And not get everybody worried, including your president, which is okay, you know. And, and the second, second line of story is really the iPod case study story, right? So, so yes, the Chinese exports, Chinese uh, companies are exporting a lot, but how much value added is there? Because in order for the firms and the workers to benefit from export, it needs to translate into value added, right? And IPAC, IPAC case study shows that the value added is actually quite low. And then also, you know, according to people from the U.S. International Trade Commission, they have shown that, you know, the foreign, foreign content in Chinese export is actually more than 50%. Okay? 
So again, just some pictures. That's just Chinese net export, okay, around 1990, and then boom, up around 2008, that's a trade collapse. Then Chinese export recovered, you know, afterwards. But, you know, this is just a show, you know, the first storyline, right? The rapid, that's a net export, huh? that's export minus import, right? This is a very high jump. But also, I calculated the, the value added per unit of export comparing, put, put together USA, okay, China, and Mexico from 1995 to 2009. What do you realize is that Chinese value added per unit of Chinese export has been declining, right? Departing from the upper bound, which is uh, USA, and approaching its lower bound, which is Mexico. Okay? So that's a value added per unit of export. Okay? So this shows the second line of the story. Okay? Now, the question is what is going on here? Right? What explains that? Okay? Now, so the next exercise I did is I tried to decompose a country's export. Okay? So think about um, think about the export. In order for a country to produce an export, right, the country needs to produce a bunch of other things in order to support the existence of that export, right? So you need to. So the country needs to produce a bunch of other stuff as the intermediate inputs. The country needs to hire workers, hire labor in order to support, you know, the the, the basket of export they're trying to produce, right? So the total value generated by a country's export. That's a total amount of, you know, intermediate inputs, labor, capital, you know, that's the country have to provide to generate that set of exports. Has to be divided into, decomposed into three components, right? Domestic intermediates, foreign intermediates, and domestic value added, right? And domestic value added is the sum of Worker's wage and firm's profit. Okay. So essentially, what I what what do we what do we are trying to say here is, is something seemingly little trivial is that the three share have to add together, right? If the if your so the value generated by export has to be decomposed into the three items, then their share have to add up to one, right? So the domestic intermediate share plus foreign intermediate share plus domestic value added share will always have to add up one as a mathematical necessity, right? Okay? During any period of time, they have to add one. I know it's a little trivial, but what is not trivial about this, this, this summation is that, as you can see, as one share change, the other shares will have to adjust to rebalance as time goes on, because they always have to add up to one, okay? Okay, now, if you understand the three decompositions, let's look at the case of China, okay, Chinese export from 1995 to 2009. Okay, this theory is the foreign intermediate share. So as you can see, the foreign intermediate share has been going up, okay, over time, which is not surprising, right, given the evidence of the prevalence of global value chain, we expect the foreign intermediate mostly to increase in most of the countries. That that's, should be a given fact which is true according to the data. But the question is, how would those other theories adjust, right, to compensate the increase of foreign intermediate share, right? If the three shares have to add up, add up to one, if foreign intermediate share goes up, either domestic value added have to go down, or, right, the foreign intermediates have to, or, or, or the domestic uh, intermediate have to go down or both, right, to compensate the change, okay? So in case of China, overall, what we see here is what I call value-added erosion. It's the injection of foreign intermediate share in response to the increase of foreign intermediate share. What we see here is the domestic value-added has been declining to compensate the increase in of foreign intermediate share, whereas domestic intermediates pretty much stay the same, okay? That's the case of China's what I call value added erosion. Increase of foreign intermediate share erodes the value added share domestically. Another case is India, okay, 
The case of India is in terms of trade, okay, this is just export, it's a little different. You see, India also experienced an increase of foreign intermediates, okay? But look at this, in response to the increase of foreign intermediates, the domestic value added holds the ground pretty well, right? But domestic intermediates will decline to compensate the increase of foreign intermediates. And this phenomenon is what I call the domestic foreign substitution. Okay? So, well, apparently, value added erosion is much more worrisome than domestic foreign substitution because the GDP is roughly measured by the value added. Right? If you measure the intermediate, it will be double counted. And also, it is a value added that's really benefiting. It's, it, it's, it's the workers and the, and the firms that are really benefiting from the value added in that company. Okay? So value added erosion is much more worrisome than domestic foreign substitution. Okay? And the question is, why would some country you know, imagine they're all facing the, 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 the phenomenon of increasing foreign intermediate? Why some country would go through value added erosion? And why would some country go through domestic and foreign substitution? Okay? Now, let's go back to this graph again. According to, uh, there was about early 2000s, there were people, you know, making some hypothesis, is that what really happening here with the value added erosion, what, when country goes through value added erosion, it must be the case that when the lead firms, right, foreign lead firms tend to expand expand their value added activity. So imagine if you're processing exporter here and you're trying to export your goods and services, you will notice that your value added is squeezing, right? If your if the foreign lead firm is actually expanding their value adding activities a lot, very rapidly. Okay? So think about what are the high value added adding activities nowadays. Again, those are the product design, advertising, financing and stuff like that. Okay? Those are actually, those are actually um, uh, activities performed by high-skilled laborers, right? I mean, if you don't have a college degree, I think it will be difficult for you to perform those high value adding activities, right? So if we want to test this hypothesis, right, we have to somehow find out, you know, how much, we have to find out, you know, the, 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 how much foreign high-skilled labor is embodied in each country's import content of export, right? And see if such expansion is correlated with the phenomenon of value added erosion, right? If we can extract the foreign high-skilled content embodied in each country's import content of export, then that becomes a very important index to test this hypothesis. But remember that you know, earlier I said I was able to do that. Right? I was able to do, using the data and, and the technique, I was able to decompose, that, decompose each country's trade and extract the labor content also by skill level, right? So, just using two country example, you have China and India, and that's a high skill labor share embodied in the import content of export, okay? This is China and this is India. And if you look at China, the high skill labor High scale labor share in body and import content export has been increasing all this time, whereas India is pretty stable. Okay, and remember, China was a country that went through value added erosion, and India was a country that went through the domestic and foreign substitution. Okay, but those are just two examples. You know, it's very important that we see if it's an overall global pattern. So we have to assess that systematically, right? Not just picking on two examples, right? So what we did, we did some econometric analysis, okay? So I'm, again, I'm not gonna bore you guys with the tables, the model, everything, but I just want to show you a couple of results, okay? So first of all, you know, in our earlier work that we have done, we found a systematic negative relationship between foreign high skill laboring in body and import content of export and domestic value added share in export, in, uh, of export uh, at cross country level. So we look at cross all countries, aggregate level, it is true, right? And also for most of countries, foreign high skill labor embodied in export has negative and statistically significant correlation with the share of 
domestic value added in export at cross sector level. So we also look at you know by sector level. Is that true statistically across the country across the sector? It is true. But what is also important, important interesting is that we realize when labor productivity, capital stock level, and the price ratio and initial output level were controlled, the relationship between foreign high skill labor embodied in the import content of export, right, and domestic value added share in value generated by export is still mostly negative and statistically significant. So very often people will say, okay, if a country goes through value added erosion, maybe it's a natural process because the country is upgrading, or country, if country was specializing in low productive sectors, and then they try to upgrade into a high productive sectors, right, then necessarily they were higher, they were into more foreign intermediates, right, and then your domestic value added share should, should decline. It's a natural process, okay? So it's not really a distributional conflict. But, Problem is that, you know, problem with this argument is that upgrading, the degree of upgrading is highly correlated with the capital stock level, right, in each sector's output. But things like even if we control capital stock level and control the domestic labor productivity level at every sector level, we still find statistically significant negative relationship between foreign high school labor embodied in important and export. And value um, added erosion. Okay. So, furthermore, you know, for manufacturing sector only, because the global value chain happens a lot in manufacturing. So, we took out manufacturing sector only. We also find, you know, statistically significant negative relationship between these two variables. Okay. So, couple of policy implications. Okay. Uh, first of all, you know, with global value chain, notice that is. We're in the world that's a much more, compli uh, more, more complication. But at the same time, don't worry, there's also more policy instruments. Look at the bright side, right? Before, if we only have final goods export import, the policy will be like what Trump does, right? If you want to use trade to generate employment, you're going to minimize, your, you're gonna minimize your, your, your import and maximize your export. That's what Dr. Bedard would call as mercantilism, right? So, but with global value chain, think about it, you really don't, you have more policy option. You don't have to change your trade policy, right, your, your export-import uh, volumes. But at the same time, you can solve some of the issues. For example, that will involve what we call industrial upgrading. That means country, so that give firms more ability to capture more gains from globalization. So instead of, so it will switch from a trade policy to industrial policy now, okay? And also, you know, higher demand for high skill labor from overseas and lower demand for lower, lower skill labor domestically because the inflow of foreign low skill labor will lead to great, greater domestic income inequality in developed countries, mostly, right? And also, developing country also might consider supporting small supplier union, unions to increase the negotiation power with the lead firms in global value chain. So people have been talking about labor union, labor union all, all this time. The point of having labor union is to provide labor with more negotiation power so they have a more proper share of your, their productivity. But the same thing for very small, uh, for small firms, especially for lower tier firms in a developing country, it might be helpful to actually support small supplier unions so they have better negotiation power, okay, to capture more gain from globalization. And like what Roderick says, okay, uh, a complicated world will require fox-like policies, okay, so it shouldn't be just, you know, one direction view, right, we need to be open-minded. Lastly, one last slide I want to present, I want to tell you, is that it depends on what you say. You know, well, who are your audiences? When I presented the UN and international organization, I stop here. But in front of a group of intellectuals, you know, I'll add one more slide. What do we end up having? Wait a minute, did I? Did I miss the last? Oh, gosh. You know, just don't want me to be intellectual. Okay. So, essentially, all we've been talking about is really nothing but a classical political economy. Okay? So, 
Classical political economists put lots of emphasis on the difference between productive and unproductive labor. Okay? Adam Smith is the first economist to start talking about the difference between productive and unproductive labor. He says that productive labor is labor that engages in producing any tangible products, whereas unproductive labor, you know, involving producing goods or services that are intangible. Therefore, hairdresser is not a productive labor, according. So we are all unproductive labor. But the Marx later on, you know, had a much more thoughtful and interesting revision of Adam Smith's definition of productive and unproductive labor. Marx thinks that any activity that engages into the production of the surplus value, okay, the value, I mean, you can think about that roughly as a global value added, okay, would be a productive, would be a productive labor. And any labor that involving appropriation of the global surplus value or global value added would be unproductive labor. Okay? So in his definition, hairdressers are productive labor, whereas the financiers are productive labor, because they're specializing in reallocating, right, or redistributing the existing core of global surplus. From this perspective, what we see here is really international division of labor into slowly, not completely, but gradually into groups of productive and unproductive labors. We have lower tier firms, often in developing countries, not always, specializing in producing the existing core of global surplus value or global value added. Okay? Then we have lead firms, right, often in developed countries, specializing in appropriating existing pool of global surplus value, such as doing things such as product design, advertising, financing, all that kind of stuff. Okay? So, Value added erosion, what we are, the phenomenon we identify here, to some extent, not completely, okay, is in fact a manifestation of the intense struggle for global surplus value. Okay? So anything you do not like about struggling for surplus value, such as exploitation, human right violation, uh, uh, those you're going to see in global value chain. If any of you remember about the suicide case in Foxconn company in China, well, that's just one example, okay? And such distributional conflict is everywhere, and it's going to be, it will be increasing. So global social institution needs to be flexible enough to adapt and adjust to such changes. Thank you very much.